ago and I've been kind of getting baptized this coming, this next Sunday. And I said, yeah. And I'm thinking the next Sunday. And she was thinking the coming Sunday. <laughs> but we got it all put together. We got it all put together. We're good now. Uh, again, uh, I'll need to meet with the uh, ones who are going on the church retreat in September. I need to meet with you in the Blue Fuse down here immediately after the church service today. We're going to Wade Floyd. I uh, got in Burke, Tennessee. But we've got to make a decision about what we're going to do about food up there. We've got a full kitchen we can cook, and we also can uh, uh, go down to Gatlinburg, okay? Well, here we go. 2 Corinthians 4, the whole chapter, verses 1 through 18. We're not going on the call for time. We're not going to read them all. We're going to just dissect a few of them. But the church of Corinth uh, was a church of the crosses. When Paul, uh, when Paul wrote the first epistle to them, he addressed the, the, uh, their sin, okay, which they were living in. Uh, Paul called them the repentance. The uh, second letter here, of course, shows that they kind of maybe obeyed uh, some of his words uh, in spite of their uh, sin. <laughs> they, they kind of improved. They got better. The people of Corinth got better. Uh, but like every church, like every church, there's room for improvement, okay? Room for improvement. Uh, we have uh, people who've criticized the, the man of God. That's what's going on here. Uh, they're criticizing Paul. So here in Corinthians, uh, they, they kind of leveled some personal attacks on Paul. It, look at uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, if you will. Uh, it says, and he said, but, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by uh, manifest, manifesting of the truth, commit, committed ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. They said that, that he, his ministry was weak and died. They said that he was dishonest. They said that he was corrupting the word of God. They said that he was hindering the, the preaching of the gospel. Paul being a man of integrity. And Paul being a man of obedience to the Lord. Uh, these accusations were probably hurtful. And they were, they were wicked and they were unfounded. Okay, In chapters 3 and 4, Paul is forced again to, uh, into this sad situation. Paul wants them to know that in spite of their attacks, in spite of their, the pressure of the ministry, let me assure you there's pressure in the ministry, okay? The, the persecution uh, he faced, the imprisonment he suffered, the, the hatred of, the, of his enemies that had, his enemies had on him, all the other pressures of his ministry he faced, he has this to say, we faint not. We faint not. Verse, look at verse one of chapter four, the very last three words in that verse, we faint not. We faint not. That phrase faint not means to, to not lose heart. To not lose heart. Paul is saying the ministry is hard. The ministry is stressful. The ministry is lonely. The ministry is painful. But I'm not going to lose heart. I'm not going to lose heart. I'm going to hang in there. Okay? I'm going to stay in there. I'm going to trust God. As Paul tells the Corinthians, uh, why he doesn't lose heart, he helps us to it well. We all know that, that we live in difficult times. Church is not important to many people anymore. No. You see the empty views, and right. it, it tells you that already. Okay. Right. Even among those who attend church, many people have trouble with the Word of God being preached. They, they bubble up. They get a, they get a, 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 a thorn in their side, you might say about it. People get mad. They leave the church over the silliest of issues. The silliest of issues. They say things like, I, I don't like what's, what's going on around here. <coughs> well, I can say the same thing. But I just looked at, hey, I just looked to the Lord. I looked at the Lord. And I, and I, don't, I don't second guess Him. Okay, I don't question Him. I, hey, I know he's working in the church, and you'll see that in here as well. I just try to go along with what he wants me to do and not get upset. 
just that and not get hurt and not get this. Hey, it's just a good thing. Biblical, hey, biblical churches aren't grown. By churches which, which create an entertainment, kind of entertain you, uh, hey, they're growing leaves and mats. Growing leaves and mats. Trying to entertain people. I'm not here to entertain you. Amen. I'll never be up here to entertain you. Okay? I'm up here to preach the Word of God. Amen. Ministry is discouraging for preachers. Life in the church uh, can be discouraging from the membership as well. To be honest, it, it's far too easy for us to lose heart. I guarantee you. Let me read you what Charles H. Spurgeon wrote in his uh, classic on lectures to my students. In a chapter properly, properly titled, The Ministry's Failing Fix. It describes the pressures upon which a, a, a Christian minister, a pastor, uh, can lose heart. Let me read it to you. So that our work, when earnestly undertaken, lies, up, li, li, lies us, lays us open to attacks in the direction of depression. Who can bear the weight of the souls without something sinking into, their, into the dust? Passionate longings after man's conversion, if not fully satisfied, and when they, and, and when they, and when, and when are they? He said, consume the soul with anxiety and disappointment. To see the hopeful turn aside, waxing more bold in sin. Are, not there, are there not sight enough to crush us to the earth? The kingdom comes not as we would. The reverend uh, name of, uh, is not hallowed as we desire. And for this we must weep. How can we be otherwise than otherwise it's horrible? Where, while man believes not our report, and the divine arm is not revealed, all mental, all mental work, uh, weak, uh, work tends to weary and to depress. For much study is the weariness of the flesh, but ours is more than mental work. It is a heart work, the labor of our inmost souls. Such soul travail as that of a faithful minister will bring an occasional season of exhaustion when hearts and flesh will fail. I say being all that. Even though you might not be a preacher, the words that Spurgeon just wrote there expresses, I think, sometimes the feelings of, of, of you and I as well. Not just the preacher, but the membership as well. We often hear the church is not growing. We often hear the, uh, the, the, the numbers are dwelling. The giving is down. Works, the workers are hard to come by. Amen. A, a spirit of complacency has inflicted itself in our membership. In many ways, there are, th these are not the things we like to hear. But we hear them all. They're negative to us. They're negative to us. They're heartbreaking to us. Okay. Paul writes about these reasons and losing hope in the midst of some pain and difficulty here. And he challenges, he challenges his readers to, to remember some important reasons to just continue, to continue in, in being hopeful, okay? In spite of, of all that's going on, hope, there's hope for the faint of heart, okay? So if, you've ever, if you ever get discouraged, if you ever want to give up, if you ever want to quit, there's hope in this chapter here. I've heard preachers say that every Monday morning they go into their office and start writing out their resignation. That can happen. Sundays can be a, a real downer for a preacher. He studies all week. He prepares all week. No one shows up. No one cares. No one's there to support him. I know these young young preachers, they don't get that often that they get the opportunity to preach. So when they do, the place will be packed. Amen. Yeah. The place will be packed. Amen. Support. It's, in, it's to encourage, not discourage. To encourage, okay? I've seen literally people walk out on a preacher as he was preaching. What a, what a discouragement. 
What a, what a, what a statement you're trying to make. God sees it. God certainly sees it. Okay? So I'm going to just a few minutes on them. Hey, for the faith. Hey, hope for the faith. Hope for the faith of all. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we are going to again today. We're asking that, Lord, that you just uh, help me. Help me. But not just help me, but help those who are here to hear. Here to get a, get a word of encouragement at a time that seems almost. There's so much going on in our world today. So much that can discourage you quickly. I pray that, Lord, one sound my voice today will be encouraged to keep on keeping up for the glory of God. Thank you, Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, again, I'm not going to read through all these verses. We're going to just go through a few of them. The first thing I made a point of was remember God redeems the law. God redeems the law. I can't go into every thing contained in these verses 1 through 6, but Paul is talking about preaching, his preaching. He's talking, he's talking about the, the people who will, will not repent under the preaching of the gospel. Paul Paul says the gospel is hidden, verse 4, is hidden. You look at it, we'll read it, let's just read it. Verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the, hey, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of, of, the, of God, should shine, shine unto them. Okay? Uh, here he's saying that again, the devil has blinded people. He's blinded them. In spite of, of the darkness and sin, Paul keeps again preaching, preaching, preaching the gospel. Verse 5, we read if you look at it. Paul reminds us when, when we were in the very same situation. I think we lose, I think we lose sight that we were in that situation. We see lost people, but we don't put ourselves in their shoes, but we were in their shoes. We walked that way. We were in, living in that darkness, okay? We were lost in sin. We were trapped in darkness. We were blinded by, again, the enemy, the devil. We were headed to hell, y'all. And somehow, hey, somehow, look at verse 6. Somehow God, who hey, commanded the light to shine out of darkness, had shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of the God of the hey, of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The same God who said, let there be life over Genesis 1, 3, is the same God who came to us when we were lost. Amen. That's the very same God that came to you and I when we were lost in our sin. He spoke to us in our darkness and, and in our, our deadness and cried, let there be light. Immediately the light came on and we were saved by the grace of God. Paul's point is this, don't lose heart because God is still saving souls. Amen. We may not always see it. I mean, it's just point of sinister, but we may not always see it. We may not always be there when they are converted. But God saves people, y'all. He saves them when they're sin, and He brings them into, into His kingdom uh, on a daily basis. On a daily basis, God is still in the same business, y'all. God is still doing the same thing He did in the early church, adding to the church daily, such as should be saved. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. God will accomplish His purpose in saving His people. Okay. Our job is to remain, to remain faithful to Him. We need to keep attending church. We need to keep attending church. I, I, I said we might have put a curse on ourselves back in 2020. I'll never forget March the 22nd of 2020. Uh, everybody started shutting the doors. We didn't shut our doors. Our doors were open. About 10 people showed up. About four or five weeks, 10 people came. And one of them was a sad person and a bed. But about 10 people came. But then we started live streaming. So we could uh, accommodate people. Boy, did we mess up there. Because now they can sit in their lounge chair, in their pajamas, Brother Alex, and, and, and see my handsome face, and hear my brilliant <laughs> sermons. <laughs> hey, and drink their coffee. Okay? They don't have to attend church. Okay? They don't have to be in it's not the same. I 
I've been there. I've listened to us on live stream and other preaching as well. It's just not the same. When you're in the presence, and when you're in this room, you're in the presence of the Holy Ghost. Okay? And you're in a lot of the presence of the Holy Ghost. You see, the Holy Ghost lives in everyone that's saved here today. And that's where we get it. Okay? We need to keep investing in the kingdom of God. We need to, we need to keep living for the Lord. We need to keep praying and reading your Bible on a daily basis. We need to rejoice in, in our salvation. Have you lost the joy of your salvation? Let me tell you what, if you can't get happy about true salvation, you get happy about my salvation. Because okay? I was a wretched sinner. And, and, and hey, God has done a miracle in my life. And y'all ought to be glad he did. Okay? It may not appear as though anything spiritual even, or even eternal with eternal value is taking place, but God is always working, and God is always, always building His church. His church is not going to go down like the Titanic. God. He, hey, He said, "Upon this rock I will build My church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it." He's in it, and He's for it, and you ought to be for it. God died for the church. If He was willing to die for the church, we would be willing to come to church someday. We're being willing to attend. We've done too many things in our way. We have too many other priorities. Sunday will be set aside for God. Oh, hey, I can remember the days when I was younger and we'd work all day, Brother Silas, out in the yard planting flowers and bushes and doing all that stuff. And I'd come in about 8 o'clock at night and dead tired. But Brother Randy gets on that down. I got him on church the next day. I didn't let that hinder me. If you've got a situation. If you got a situation, hey, if you got a situation where Saturday takes you away from Sunday, you better change it. Amen. You better switch it. Amen. You better say, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit right here in my lounge here all day Saturday, rest up, my buddy, I'm gonna hit the church door on Sunday morning. I'm gonna hit it at 9.30 for Sunday school too. Sunday school is like I just thought to it. Alright, second, verses 7 through 12. Remember God reinforces the weak. He reinforces the weak. Every thought we have about being redeemed, God reminds us of our wickedness, hey, our weakness in, in verse number seven. Verse number seven said, so, but, but we have, hey, this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not, and not, hold up right here, and not, and not of us. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That phrase earthen vessels refers to jars of clay. Clay containers are weak in nature and easily broken. By our salvation, God gave us God working in our lives and, 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 and it's solid. It's solid and it's powerful. But this salvation is contained in a weak vessel which is prone to faith. That's this. That's it. Paul talks about the struggles in verses 8 to 11. I'm just going to hit on these. You look at them. He says he is troubled. He's perplexed. He's persecuted. He's cast down. He's always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. In the middle of everything he faces, Paul ex hey, experiences the, the, uh, the opposite, pretty much, of what his enemy expected. He experiences the opposite of what the enemy thinks he ought to experience. He said, I was troubled when I was, when I was not distressed. He was afflicted, but he, 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 he hey, but not confined. He was, he was perplexed, but not distracted. He was, he was at, at a loss as to what to do, but he was filled, he, he was not filled with anxiety or fear. So the enemy thinks that's what you're going to do. That's what he did during COVID. That's what he did. That's what he did during the pandemic. Fear took everybody over. Hey, Paul says, hey, I, I, I was, yeah, I was perplexed. I was in despair. I was lost. I, I, I know, I know what to do. I know what to do. But I was not filled with anxiety and fear. They said he was persecuted. 
not forsaken. He was, pers hey, he was persecuted. He was hated. But he was not abandoned by God. God was still with him through it all. He said, I was cast down, but not destroyed. Hey, he was knocked down, y'all, but he wasn't knocked out. He just kept on going, kept on going. See, we get a little, hey, we get a little hang down, we're going to stay home in church. Hello? We get a hang down. And not only do we have to stay home in church, we have to have our whole family stay home in church, too. Right. That hang down thing didn't work. I can hang it up, you know. <laughs> Okay. Hey, in the end, everything Paul endured in his life and everything that we endure in our lives is to allow God, is to allow Jesus, hey, to be seen in our lives. What's the worst thing you can do when you get down now? Is show it to everybody else. Because what it does is drag everybody else down now. Okay? This place is weak, God. Hey, it, and in the flesh, we often lose hope. We often lose hope. We must remember that we live in a very fragile body. Paul called it an earthen vessel. This earthen vessel, we, in, it, in it we suffer many trials and difficulties. Things are coming our way. Trials are going to come your way for, for a growing purpose. And that's why God said, so yet the things we endure are made for the glory of God. God's doing something. When we, when we continue to serve God in spite of the afflictions we, that we're going to face in our flesh, our lives will glorify God. Our lives testify of, of, of hey, to everyone who witnesses our, hey, what's going on in our life. That we're operating not under our power, but under the power of God. And we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it. Verse 7. See, we're weak. But through Jesus, we, hey, we are used by God in mighty ways. Don't lose heart, child. Don't lose heart. God will not leave you. God is not going to leave you. Hey, it was Hebrews 13, 5 says. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. God will strengthen you uh, for the road ahead that you've got to face. He'll, have, he'll use you for His glory. Remember, God has a purpose for everything you face. I mentioned this morning in Sunday school. God has a purpose for everyone in this room right now. What you need to do is find out what it is in your life He wants you to do. He, he is using you for His glory. He wants to use you for His glory. He wants to mold you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Romans 8, 28, which you know in my heart. But if we know that all things, that's hard, but it is true. We know that all things, no matter how bad, no matter how dark it gets, or how good it gets, all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to His purpose, Romans 8, 28. Don't lose heart. Hey, God can strengthen the weak of God. How about verses 13, 14? You look at it. Remember, God raised the dead. He raises the dead. In Paul's case, his service to God ended up with him being martyred uh, for the cause of Christ. The Roman government executed Paul, executed him for preaching the gospel. It could happen in our day. That could be coming our day. Paul wrote in verse 12, he said, So then death worketh in us. Paul may, not have, Paul may not have known how true that statement would be in his life. In the end, death claimed Paul for the glory of God. And even though Paul faced death on a daily basis, on a daily basis, Paul, hey, Paul believed God would one day raise him from the dead, which he would. He believed in the resurrection. This allowed Paul to put everything on the line for Jesus. Didn't matter what. He wasn't worried about what might happen to him. His primary concern was bringing, being used for God. And God might be glorified through his life. People would see God in him. 
see Jesus in him? Do people see Jesus in us? Do they see us doing that very thing that Paul did, trying to glorify the Lord? Even the threat of death was not enough to, to hinder Paul. And the threat of death in the service of Jesus should not stop us either. I'll be honest, it should never stop us either. Do you remember what, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24 when he said, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Are you a cross bearer today? Are you bearing the cross for Jesus? Or are you living for self? Don't get down hearted, okay? If we must lay everything, if we lay everything on the altar of sacrifice for Jesus, we have, hey, we have really not lost anything. See, if we are God's, He owns us. 1 Corinthians, back over in 6, chapter 6, 6 verse 19, 20. Check it out. But He owns you and I. If you've been saved, He owns you. You're not your own. He owns you. So even if our service to the Lord cost us everything, 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 we lose it all, hey, we're only giving back to God what He already, what He already owns. Amen. It's His anyway. I think someone mentioned it more maybe Brother Brother Mike here in the offering. God it's all God's. You give ten percent, but that's 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 God's. God could ask for 90% and let you attend. You probably couldn't have gone to groceries and bought groceries. Okay? If, you, if we could just grasp this truth, we, I think we'd be freed from the fears we'd be, that, that, that worry us to death, that wrap us up, that, that set us back, hold us back. Give your all to Jesus. And even if you die to it, God still will raise you from the dead. The grave, you know, you're not going to lay in no grave, y'all. If you're saved, if you're saved, hey, as soon as you check out of here, as soon as you check out, as soon as you take your last breath, guess where you are? In the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You're not going to see no grave. You're not going to be in no ground. Hey, you're going to be in heaven. Your soul will be in heaven. You'll, you'll always be there with him. So don't worry about death. Don't let death do you. When I was laying back on, on an operating table on the first day of the year of 2015 with a heart that had been that big, they figured to open me up like a, you know, to lay me. Hey, death never entered my mind. They said, did you ever think about dying? I didn't think about dying. It didn't matter. I was a winner either way. If I left out of here, I'd, I'd pay up. I'm going to go far better. A lot better in this place. So if it bothered me, it shouldn't bother you. You shouldn't fear death if you're saved. Paul didn't fear death. Paul made that statement not knowing that that's exactly what's going to happen. He chopped his head off. Didn't matter. As soon as they chopped his head off, guess what? He got to see Jesus again. He's like on the road to Nazareth that time. He heard Jesus. Yeah. He got to hear him in person then. Let's wind it up in verses 15 through 18. Remember, God rewards the faithful. This is important. God rewards the faithful. In the end, Paul knows all the trials of life are temporary. They're temporary. He knows that they will end someday. And I think they'll end for us soon, pretty soon. He also knows that as he walks through the cemetery of this world, the old man, the outward man, is dying every day. But the inner man is renewed and restored and refreshed day after day. As we walk through the through the shifting, unstable sands of this fallen world, we must learn to view. We must learn to view earth through and view it through through heaven's eyes. Think about that. 
You go over to chapter 20, 21 and 22 of Revelation and read about that. Streets of gold, and gates of pearl, and all those great things. But the greatest thing is Jesus is there. You're going to be in his presence throughout eternity. There'll be no more weeping, no more sickness, no more, hey, no more cancer, no more heart issue, no more of that stuff. It'll all be gone. We need to, we, we often think only about how we feel and, and what, we're, what we're going through and, and how bad it is and, and how hurt we are. But what we fail to remember is that all of our affliction is it, 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 just, hey, it's just working for us. It's not working against us, it's working for us. See, it seems to be in our lives that God says that that things and all things are good. Paul tells us here that, that our afflictions, which seem to be heavy and intense and, and, and unending here on earth, but from heaven's perspective, it's just light affliction. Just light affliction. Paul says they, they become, hey, we need to develop a, 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 our lens uh, of heaven, viewing heaven uh, and, and realizing how beautiful heaven is. And that's where we'll be headed. We're headed that way. We need to put our treasures up in heaven and think about heaven instead of what's going on on earth because it's all temporary. Looking through, again, through the lens that Paul looked through, uh, hey, the, the, the glories were that were awaiting him in heaven. And when he saw where he was going, he realized how small and insignificant and, and short these trials here, these trials here actually are. I think this, uh, we understand why Paul was allowed to write in Romans 8 18. He said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be hey, which shall be revealed. In us. He's talking about that. He's talking about, hey, I'm not looking here. I'm not looking to suffer here in this present time, but I'm comparing it with the glory that's before me in heaven. His perspective in, 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 in verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. What Paul said is, uh, what I know about heaven is so wonderful. And I keep my eyes, I keep my eyes turning toward home, my eternal home. Everything there will last forever. Everything here is just for a moment. I'd rather focus, I'd rather focus on what is mine forever throughout eternity than to focus on what what is just a short here for a short time. See like Paul we must learn to to live above sea level. S E E level. Okay. Paul 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 knew his life hey was just a baby. And you should know your life was just a baby. You may live to be a hundred but it's still a baby. You may live to be eighty it's still a baby. Went out to my sister yesterday. She's doing quite well. Uh, Going to get out in about two weeks. She'll be out of rehab. Uh, got to find a place for her to go there. But uh, it was an emotional time for her. Uh, she cried a lot. Uh, turned 84. Uh, but we had a good time. The room was packed and full. Had, you know, some gifts for her. Cupcakes and so on. But as I watched her and I looked at her, it broke my heart a little bit. But I realize our life's just a baby. Just a baby. Paul said he'd be here for a short time, but he'd be gone. Same is true of you and I. We may struggle, we may suffer here, but it's only here for a short time. See, when we leave this world, we'll be, re hey, we'll, hey, we'll be remade in the perfect image of Jesus Christ our Savior. And in our new bodies, we will live in God's presence in God's heaven forever and ever. One day, one day, a weight of glory will descend on me and you. The weight of glory will be, will be the, so it'll be so profound. It'll be so filled with glory and, and every 
deep and dark trial that we've ever faced in our life will seem like just a, a short walk to a little dark alley. Okay? The glory of heaven will be, be so, so real and so profound. The afflictions, the afflictions of this life will seem as just no more than, than a mere momentary anxiety. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. God sees your faithfulness to Him and, he, and, and, and to His will. And He will reward you for your faithful service. One day, this short life will come to an end. And when it does, when it does, we're going to fly away home to a land where the, where the glory will, will, will never wear away. It'll never be consumed. It always, it's going to be wonderful there. Those temporary troubles that we have down here in this world give way hey, to an eternal glory in heaven. Okay? Think about that. In heaven, God will reward your faithfulness to it. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. We're, we're going home sometime soon. His bow lines are closed. Do you feel like giving up? Do you feel like giving up? Those who have come from baptism get prepared for that. Will. feel like you that? Do you find yourself disappointed, discouraged, maybe disillusioned by the problems of life? I think we all have those times. I have them. I'm sure everyone has them. We don't need to lose heart, though. The best is yet to come. If you're, if you're a child of God, the best is yet to come. If you're discouraged, if you feel defeated, remember what Paul, remember what Paul says in these verses. Keep serving. Just keep going, just keep on going. Don't stop, don't quit. Everything, everything is going to be all right in the end, okay? So just don't get, don't get discouraged. Don't get down so far that you do chin up on a dime. Don't get down to where you, where you just can't serve God. Feel like you can't serve God anymore. You can't get with God anymore. Don't quit. Don't quit. Hey, don't lose heart. If you're lost today, I, I plead with you to come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's so simple. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that he, he lived on this earth for 33 and a half years. Done miraculous things. Raised the dead, healed the sick, did all those things. But he took the cross. He died on the Lord the cross for you and I. Gave his life, sacrificed himself for us. He was a lamb, a sacrificial lamb. He died there. They placed him in a tomb, sealed it up, thought they had it. The boys sang this last week about the judgment where the devil thought he had, he had Jesus there. He had him locked up in that tomb. But three days later, he arose. He came out of the grave. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father this morning, interceding for you and I. Think about that. The death, burial, and resurrection. If you can believe that in your heart, not in your head, but in your heart, and you can know with, with true assurance that that is exactly what he did for you and I, for our sins. You can be saved. You can be saved. If you lost today, Accept that. Accept that in your heart. Christian, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't quit on God. You quit on him, he may quit on you. He says you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. He might just say, if you quit on me, I'll quit on you. And when you need him, and you call on him, he don't show up. Hmm. Wouldn't that be bad? I don't think we serve a God in such a way. But I don't know why God operates. But I know He does chastise His children. I know He will give you a whooping if you're not, if you're not doing what you should be doing. And you will suffer something. You'll suffer something. 
Thank you, Pastor. If you need to come down, come down and come on as we prepare for baptism. But Ruben, won't you lead us in a song?
So she's coming that way. She's coming to join the church to the statement of faith and also to baptism. So we'll baptize her today. And are you still saved? Does that will baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? And in the likeness of his death. Amen. Amen. Y'all hang around and see her. <clears throat> be down in just a few minutes, okay? Let's be dismissed. Brother Mike, I want you to get the microphone and dismiss us in prayer. You who are going on the retreat, hang around and go on the retreat with us now. It's a step. Okay, let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you, Lord, for our salvation through Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're so thankful that we were able to see this picture of salvation in one of our uh, dear folks here, Anna. And so uh, we pray, Father, that you continue to use her in a mighty way, that you would develop her and show her, Lord, what your will is for her life, that she may walk your path, Father, the path that is the good life. We all know, we all believe that the godly life is the goodly life. And so I just pray, Father, that you press upon her heart what it is that you want her to do with, with her life. And Father, pray and protect us as we go. Keep us safe and help us to take what we've learned into the world about us. We love you. Thank you for all that you've done. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as Pastor said, if you're going to the way.